the, the music helps us to identify with Clarice, with the Jay Foster character, very intensely. Yes, there's a couple of interesting things about it that I can mention in terms of the relationship of music uh, to the drama. Uh, music is very much a point of view, and Jonathan Demme, who directed the film, great director, in a spotting session to the film, he just said to me, perhaps we take the viewpoint of Clarice Starling, in the film. This is very early on in the working process, which is not really how a genre movie, they weren't really made that way. You would, generally, you would take the view of the monster, the Hannibal Lecter, the bigger character you would focus on. And by taking, by directing me that way, I actually wrote a score based on Clarice's journey, which was unique at the time, I think. In, in terms of this type of film. And I think that Ellip took it from the genre into something much bigger. And I think that still it's appealed today for audiences, you know, for women and men, because it really had to do with the performance of Clar uh, Jodie Foster, essentially, of Clarice. And I think that was the success that led to the Oscar. And, you know, I think it's, it's a very special film. The other thing I was going to say about the music is I was using a lot of electronic techniques with video drone and after hours was a completely electronic score. It didn't use have any microphones in the recording. And I was still involved in electronics at the time. And with these scores, with uh, Silence of the Lambs and Seven, which we're going to see a little later, I used to create these, uh, I think, I, I don't know how you would describe them, but I used to create these ghost patterns uh, with the notation, with the actual notation and I would input the notation into the computer, which was a Sinclair at the time. Now there's a lot of different systems. And I would create these unsettling uh, uh, patterns with the score that I had written, using a lot of ambient sound, uh, underwater sounds, whale sounds, industrial sounds, a lot of things slowed down. And I put that under the orchestra, and it created this really unbalanced, unsettling feeling, and that actually runs all through Silence of the Lambs. So even though you're hearing what you think is symphony orchestra playing, there are these other elements that are working away at your uh, emotional <laughs> well-being that are creating this unsettled feeling about it, and I think that really keeps you hinged to the edge of your seat. Uh, we, we always hear that uh, uh, studios give composers very little time to do their scores. They're called up three, four weeks before the opening and said, okay, do a score. Uh, do you find that you... Well, that's a pretty short period. period. I've never <laughs> heard two or three weeks. <laughs> that's a little short. But if, you, if you're given a commission, can you see the entire film at one go, or do you tend to have to compose the sequences sent to you by the director? Oh, no, it's best to work on the whole film. You always want to see the whole film. The best way to start is to, I always start with a screenplay. Every film has a screenplay. And you want to start, I love to start with the words. And if there's source material, which this had a great book by Harris, you want to read that. And so you delve into the world of it, I think, just in the ideas inherent in the writing. As you did with Tolkien much later, of course. Yes, exactly. I had the great book to work with. So the book is always is essentially very important to me. And I've done a lot of literary adaptions, like Naked Lunch, J. William Burroughs, or J.G. Ballard's Crash, and Shakespeare's uh, Looking for Richard. Yeah. Um, so I love to read. That's always the beginning to me. And without any visual, I like to absorb the ideas uh, inherent in the story. Mm -hmm. And I like to feel that and write to that. And I can write very well in that way. And a lot of scores, especially with David, uh, with Cronenberg, who's not using music. Uh, and he's using music. We're, we're working in a more ambiguous way. We're not trying to really use music to expo tell the audience anything or how the story should feel. And you'll see that in the clip on Crash. It's used in a different way. And uh, which I, I enjoy, and and so I would always start from that inner uh, feeling, and it's almost like a dream state where you're just free associating to the ideas of the story. Then I love to watch the film once as a feeling like an audience member alone in a in a theater, darkened, uh, so there's no distraction, and then absorb the imagery, and usually that's enough for me. It's like I have a good memory, 
and I have the story, and now I have the visual images, and I can bring them up, and I know all the layers of the visual imagery. I, in my memory, I can remember what shots there were, what, what was great about the editing, what was great about the shots, the acting, how uh, the light moved on the screen, the, the cinematography, I'm absorbing it all, taking it all in. And then I can write from that. I can essentially write the score based on those ideas and the story and the visualization. And then there's a later process, which is really scoring the film. It has to do with a spotting session with the director. So you have this body of work, if you will. It's rough stage, but you have the raw material. It could be 20 to 40 to 50 minutes of, of raw material of music. And uh, then the spotting session with the director, where he's going through together with you each scene, and you discuss why is there music here? Why is it needed? What is it doing? What's its role? What's its point of view? Like Jonathan saying, the point of view is Clarice, and not yeah. an animal collector. Very important. So you're writing for that perspective. And then, then once you have the spotting, then you're the scoring, if you will. And what I do is I look at my body of notes, my work that I've created for the story, and then I start to go through it and pick the pieces out and try to place them into the film. And it's a bit of a puzzle. If I have a work here and I have a work here and I'm trying to find, how does this relate to it? You know, why, why did I write that? It must mean something. And sometimes it's late in the process and you've put all the pieces in. There's always one or two over here and you can't figure out where do they go? They must go somewhere. And then usually you find where they go and why they were meant to, to be there. Sometimes they even go into things like the end credits. 